Okay, so now let us begin with the first session. Uh, the, our first session, uh, the first talk will be taken by Professor Janani Sri Muralidharan. Uh, he is a professor uh, in IIT Bombay in the Mechanical Engineering Department. She is also our principal investigator um, of this project. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Pail. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Welcome, and uh, you are, uh, you know, taking part in this three-day workshop, which I hope will be very uh, useful and uh, informative in that sense. Okay, so um, let me uh, start off with a, a quick uh, overview of, because one of you had asked the question of what background is required knowledge-wise. Uh, and what you would be learning. So a very quick overview of what you would be learning in this workshop, right? So yes, you will be learning uh, open form, the software itself. Um, the other add-on takeaways, what are you going to use open form for is there's going to be a lot of uh, fluid uh, flow simulation. So what you will learn is how to, um, you know, create a geometry, how are you going to mesh the geometry, um, how are you going to solve flow problems in it, um, then how are you going to uh, try and solve heat transfer based problems in it. Maybe we will have one or two sessions on if you can try and code something uh, in open form. So we will take you to the bandwidth of flow and heat transfer problems, some very basic ones, laminar flow, turbulent flow, uh, conduction, uh, convection problems, uh, and finally finish off with some amount of coding. So as a beginner's workshop, this would take you through the general span of CFD. So before I begin, I would like to understand, uh, so a lot of you are students, uh, which is good. Uh, but generally, can you tell me if um, do you have a background in CFD? All you can say is Y or N. And I do you know what CFD is? Do you have a background in CFD? You can just type in the chat box. So there's a large mix of uh, yes and no's. And that, that's fine. That's okay. It doesn't go. It's not going to cripple you. So, uh, does answers count? Well, uh, you probably know the basics of clicking certain things. Um, but what I'm saying by CFD is the background. All right. So I can see a mix, which probably uh, is fine uh, because we we have factored in that, and what we intend to do in this first section is give you a. Uh, overview of what uh, CFD is, what exactly does uh, CFD do, okay? Um, now, the question I have for you is, are you all familiar with uh, the numerics of CFD? Hmm. Okay, some of you are, I can understand, okay. So, uh, and some of you don't, there's a lot of ends as well. So today we're going to talk to you a little bit about, uh, a little bit background about the numerics of CFD because that becomes very essential uh, for understanding what open form does, okay? All right. Now, coming back to this question of why open form. So like Payal uh, told you, open form is an open source software. So I'll go a little bit further, uh, having dealt with this uh, area for a couple of years now. Why do you have to learn open form? I mean, fine, it's open source, but what is what is your takeaway? So the important thing as students you'll have to understand is either going ahead, once you graduate, you're either going to go in for higher studies or you're going to probably take up a job, maybe have a startup company, so in all these three options, open form will play a major role. I'll tell you why. Uh, if you're a student and you're going to be going into probably higher studies with research intentions, um, a large part of universities are now moving towards open source softwares because of course it's free, but also because open form allows you to do um, a lot of 
corrections or you know add equations for your advanced applications um and what it already has now does that mean you have to code everything from scratch do you have to write a code from scratch no it has inbuilt solvers in it and you know you can have add on equations as per your need so if i'm having a, a magnetic force added to a flow problem i can take a flow solver and i just have to add a magnetic equation right so the usability for advanced applications is more okay what if you're going to companies companies have also started taking open form because they need advanced applications right so they can't do uh, in house code writing they can't probably uh, you know have a lot of commercial code software licenses it's not viable and with you know make in bharat and all those kind of atmanirbhar bharat lot of people are developing stuff here so that means that they have to write new equations for their own applications advanced applications so the idea here is to have be able to uh, make these modifications and if you are a person who knows open form it's an add on package for your company right and startups of course because of the cost uh, issues you would prefer an open source software and something that you can patent and you can use as your in house code so across the breadth um, i think uh, open form is very 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 important and uh, i hope uh, as beginners and learning in this you should uh, definitely use these three days of workshop we have experts coming in giving you basic lectures and having you some uh, you know some hands on experience in open form okay so going ahead let me um, start off so i'm going to talk to you my goal would be in the next say 45 minutes give you an overview of uh cft okay because um i see that um there are few people who do not know cft so let's have a quick overview birds eye view of what cft is and how is this kind of mapped on to your open form okay so as far as cft is concerned okay and open form is concerned let's understand what we uh do as far as uh open form is concerned so open form essentially helps you um, take a problem think of it like a flow around an aeroplane right so you will take a problem and you will have um, make a geometry of it and then you would probably uh, create a domain or a mesh and then you would quickly try and solve uh, this right with some kind of you will if some of you have used uh, commercial softwares you will select a laminar flow or turbulent flow you will set boundary conditions and so on and so forth and you will kind of uh, you know say run and then it's going to run now that gives you some kind of a picture of fluid behavior afterwards right but now this is not uh, per se cfd it's a front end but this is not what the back machine does okay so what we'll have to uh, learn today is uh, the actual back end what is happening because that becomes very important um, in open form because open form is a terminal based and you have a lot of control in these back end controls and that's going to help you do your simulations accurately okay so when you're talking about um, cfd and the back end then the first thing that's going to matter to you is going to be um your governing equations so can someone just uh, speak up and say what governing equations i probably am talking about anyone equation of motion madam navier stokes okay yes navier stokes so um what what constitutes the navier stokes good momentum continuity momentum continuity equation momentum <laughs> equation absolutely great so we have uh, predominantly three equations which is your um, so you're going to have your mass uh, your momentum which is a bunch of three equations anyway um, and then you're looking at uh, energy equation if you're solving for heat transfer okay so now uh, these are the equations you will be solving right 
But let's take a step back because these are equations you're very familiar with. But let's take, say, probably the momentum equation or what we call as a momentum equation. Um, so uh, the other terminology for this uh, set of equations are called conservation equations, right? So why are they known as conservation equations? Because they talk about some basic laws, right? Mass cannot be created, right? And momentum is F is equal to MA, correct? So, um, so when you're talking about these fundamental laws, which is why they're called conservation equations, they talk about some physics, the fundamental physics, um, then we need to question uh, where this law or basis what this law has come about. Okay, so if you remember, F is equal to MA is um, something which was developed for the system. Now, what do I mean by a system? An apple, right? So it was developed for a system. Okay, now, fine. But right now, I'm trying to use, uh, you know, for maybe a dog or an apple or say a truck, one particular entire system, F is equal to MA, I'm trying to apply it for this fluid medium because we're doing computational fluid dynamics, right? So then comes the question, can I, how do I apply a very systemic uh, law to say this fluid medium? That's the fundamental question that I will have. So um, then what happens is you think about how can I solve um, these fluid mediums, okay? So typically, there are two ways of trying to solve fluid dynamic problems. Uh, one is your Eulerian method, and the other one is your Lagrangian, okay? Now, what do I mean by these two? So one, one way of solving the fluid problem is I can seed a particle in the fluid, and I can go and travel, sit on the particle and travel with the particle and notice what velocity and direction changes the particle has as it's moving through the fluid. Okay. So that's called the Lagrangian approach. So I think of an imaginary particle and that's moving along the fluid and I'm tracking it. However, the fluid is made of several such particles, right? So um, if, if the domain is small for certain specifics, uh, you know, applications, Lagrangian equations are great. On the other hand, I can say, listen, I'm not going to travel with the fluid. I'm going to stand in one location and let me have a window in front of me. And I'm just going to look at what is going to come in and move out of that particular window, right? And that's going to tell me what largely happens in this fluid. So in that sense, I'm looking at what is called the Eulerian framework, okay? Or in other words, a control volume framework because I'm having a particular control volume and I'm only monitoring what is happening in that control volume of this fluid, okay? A large number of CFD problems um, and what we would be doing with open foam uh, pertains to the control volume approach or the Eulerian approach. So then the next question comes in, right? So now I've told you that uh, the fundamental laws are systemic, right? And uh, what we have is a control volume through which fluid moves and, and moves out. So the, it's just an empty volume through which fluid is moving. So how do I apply a systemic law to a control volume law becomes the question. I can't use a systemic law directly in its sense into a control volume. How does F is equal to MA apply to this control volume where fluid is moving in and moving out? Okay, so that's where uh, something called the Reynolds transport theorem. Okay, Reynolds transport theorem comes into play. A very powerful theorem, which has actually done this conversion for you, okay? So I hope everyone's following me at this point, right? So now moving to this, uh, what this Reynolds transport theorem is, don't worry about all this very cryptic math. It's actually very simple, right? Um, so say you have this space, an observation space that I told you, right? And fluid is entering and leaving the control volume, okay? So my interest now is what is 
the event happening inside this control volume what is happening in this control volume okay because i'm going to consider this control volume as that system okay but the system usually in an apple case you don't have things moving in and moving out right but in this control volume this is the system but something is moving in and moving out so what is happening to the system is what i want to say so i say um that in this system there is a volume so something that changes with the volume so um essentially you are having um a system in which the control volume uh, there is some change happening in the control volume which is volumetric so for example you can think of say a nuclear reactor which is generating heat right within the control volume so that means the heat inside this control volume is just going to increase because of the chemical reactions inside so we have we say that the change in the system is equal to what is happening inside the control volume okay that's the first term what is happening within the control volume and what is the net inside and outside of this control volume inside and outside of the control volume okay so you have two terms which say that if i want to quantify what is happening inside the control volume i will say that it's the sum of the change that is happening inside the control volume plus what is the net change across the surface okay so that is what the reynolds transport theorem says so essentially he says the single value of system dn by dt change in the system is equal to the control volume inside change plus the surface area okay fine so now if i were to rewrite my main equations which is your mass saying no mass can be developed on its own so i say that the net change in the system is zero right mass can neither be created or destroyed so i'm just saying that but i'm also saying that that's equal to the change in the density and the inlet and outlet flux say something is becoming from water liquid to gas right so the volume inside will change and there's going to be some inside outside flux correct so you're saying that that's change in the control volume plus flux okay so the traditional conservation equations that you have been familiar people who have looked at cfd and looked at those equations um it's a combination of a control volume change plus a control surface change okay um and that is why you are getting this expression and for example this is your f is equal to ma right so i'm saying that the change in the system dn by dt right is equal to the forces right f is equal to ma so these are my forces okay and in the change ma is what acceleration so i need to take care of the acceleration that's happening in this control volume so i have two terms which is the change in momentum right change in momentum within the control volume and across the surface theek okay? hai all right so what have we learned till now we have learned that um you have basic systemic laws which are conservation laws now these need to be converted into a control volume framework not one system but a control volume which is fluid now there's something called the reynolds transport theorem which does this conversion for you and in this conversion what happens is this f is equal to ma this one ma term becomes into two terms one is the change within the control volume and change across the surface okay so that is where you've got your traditional navier stokes equation because they've been con converted into a control volume framework okay so now we've come to the control volume framework we've, got, we've gotten this standard form of navier stokes equation which all of you probably are familiar with any fluid dynamics person would know this okay now from cfd perspective from open foam perspective we are going to have a, a, a look at a slightly different thing okay so we're going to look at two things one is the numerical aspect of what i'm showing you these two equations and the other is the mathematical aspect okay now this might sound similar mathematical and numerical but there is definitely a difference okay now when i talk about um 
mathematical what i mean by is um you can see say a uh, a uh, a ball a cricket ball that's just moving across uh in terms of fluid you can have a fan or a blower and you see air moving past right so you can say that oh listen i'm going to solve that flow field of okay, of air movement using the momentum equation okay and it has all these terms that's there in it okay there are four terms that you see um but what what is important what i mean by mathematical is uh, there is some kind of physics or physical uh, phenomenon that's happening the distinction you see in the next slide so if i have a flow through a pipe right now if i'm having a flow through the pipe what drives the flow anyone pressure difference pressure drop the pressure drop the pressure difference absolutely so now it's a pressure but the pressure drop right so um i i do see a term here which is looking at uh, the pressure gradient essentially okay so um there are terms each of these terms have a specific meaning and a specific role to add to this effect so now if i have a pipe that's horizontal versus a pipe that's vertical i would have an additional gravitational force that's going to be acting on this okay so the top part of the fluid and the bottom part will have different uh, behaviors okay now that is going to be important with the gravitational force term so each one of these terms are capturing something physical that's happening in your fluid in a mathematical framework that's where i mean by mathematical framework okay now the second part is something called the numerical framework now what i mean by the numerical framework and this has more importance in cfd i have this kind of equation that's already in place right these two equations that are there okay the first equation we'll come back to it later but these two equations that's there now if you look at the equations um most of them also have uh four terms okay now i i will add a q double prime which is a generation term so that there's a source term okay now when you look at this um let me try and circle the common terms right so apparently there's a a divergence kind of a term here so you have similar constructs correct except this is a v term this is a t term correct um you probably have a similar construct here right and you seem to have a temporal term in both cases okay and maybe some uh, source term or a generation term okay so largely this momentum and energy equation seem to have several constructs which are very similar but i'm talking about in one case a momentum and the other case energy right uh, or flow and heat transfer correct so they seem to be largely different quantities but they seem to have similar equations correct so then uh, we think about what is common so what is common essentially it is transport of some quantity in fluid flow what is the transport that you're talking about momentum so there's momentum transport okay and in uh, heat transfer there's temperature or enthalpy transport that's happening right so one can quantify those two equations into a single equation which is called your transport equation and if you note here i have replaced either t or you know the momentum in terms of phi a common variable in terms of phi okay so essentially what we're trying to see here in cfd or in open form is can i write um equations in a common construct because when you're coding you don't want to have a full momentum equation and then full an energy equation if i have a transport equation per se and i say if p is equal to momentum or if p is equal to temperature then these are the things that you will have to substitute and do right so then i have a common construct called transport equation so this is the numerical aspect so you have certain um operators which are available for you which you 
which are common and you exploit that. Okay, so categorizing these into common mathematical operators are called numerical uh, aspects of CFD. Mathematical aspects are the physics behind it. So what did I say? There could be a gravity happening and there could be a pressure drop. Now you see um, there are two terms here, right? Okay, now these two, and this we know is a temp, uh, time change. So I have a control volume and there's something changing within this width time, right? So um, width time, there is something changing within the system, volumetric, and there's a source term, say as something burning inside, great. Now, what are these two terms? That is very key because those are the transport terms, okay? Now, what are the transportation phenomenon we know of? Anyone? Okay, so one is advection and the other one is diffusion, right? Correct. So let's understand what is advection and diffusion, right? So if I have a very hot body of liquid within a, a chamber, right? Do you think it's going to be stationary? Every molecule is going to be vibrating because of the heat energy, okay? So that is called, um, so when it's vibrating, every surrounding particle is also going to vibrate and it's going to get that information. So that is called diffusion, okay? Meaning in all directions that energy diffuses from the central point. Now, convection means that, say if I have a fan, it's blowing a bulk fluid in a particular direction. There's one significant directional movement. So that's called advection. So I can have a fan blowing and there's just one advective movement, right? Or now in that same advective movement, if I have hot fan, hot air blowing fan coming in, then the surrounding regions, I'll find it a little hotter, right? Why does that happen? In addition to this advection, there is also this heat energy transfer, which is a diffusive movement that's happening, okay? So every phenomenon will have two types of transport happening. One is your advection and your diffusion, okay? So typically, this is diffusion, okay? And this is your advective term. So what are you trying to tell everyone? Hey, listen, I have this equation. It has four terms. So I have a system. This system change, transport in this system happens by some change within the control volume, some source term like gravity force on this. Okay, the fluid is going to be affected by that as well as what is the flow behavior, which is advective. And this flow behavior can be, uh, you know, combination of bulk movement plus vibratory movement. That's all those four terms mean, okay? And this is what is central to your CFD equations that you will be solving, okay? So now, once you've understood these basic conservation equations, mass, momentum, and energy, momentum and energy have a common transport equation formulation. We have learned that. Now, how do I apply this in CFD, right? How am I going to go and solve this part? Okay, so now let's come to what is called the finite volume method, which is largely what is used. Um, there is finite element method and so on and so forth. We, we will not go into that, but there's finite volume method, which is what open form is based on. Okay, so now uh, this is the numerical specifics that I'm talking about, right? So say you have a domain, which is a square that you see on this, it's a room, say it's a room, right? And what you're trying to do is uh, divide, um, you want to try and understand the flow in this room, okay? So imagine there's a fan right in the middle. Uh, the flow inside the room is not going to be uniform, correct? Under the fan, it's going to be something different. Near the door and the window, it's going to be something different. So you have different uh, behaviors. Now, I can't look at this room then in one whole box. I probably have to, you know, divide under the fan into one zone and look at it near the window separately so that I get more accurate information of the flow. So now dividing this domain into uh, smaller boxes so that I can study it more accurately is a process which is very key to 
CFD. And this process is called meshing. Okay. Meshing or grid generation. Dividing the domain into different boxes. Now, what I will do in each of these boxes, I will solve all those equations that we just talked about in each of these boxes so that I know the velocity, the pressure in each of these boxes. Okay. All right. So now I have meshed the domain. And what did I say? I'm going to use the governing equations in each of these boxes. Okay. Now, these governing equations are, I told you already for a control volume, correct? But there's a catch there. It's written, it's written for an infinitesimal control volume. Okay. It's partial differential equation. It's written for an infinitesimal control volume. Now, my control volume is going to be bigger than that, right? So what I will do is I will end up this equations which you have, I will end up integrating it, okay, for this control volume, for every specific control volume. I will integrate it, okay. Now, when I integrate it, then I will have some expression, correct? But mind you, this is computational fluid dynamics, meaning I am solving it in a computer. So if I'm going to solve it in a computer, what do I need? I need it to be an algebraic equation, correct? So I have an algebraic equation that needs to be formed, okay? So this um, governing equation to a that is the PDE when I'm integrating, it will form a, 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 an equation and then I make specific choices in that equation to make it uh, algebraic. So there's important choices that you make, okay? Now we will see some examples now very quickly. So you'll be making some specific choices for making this algebraic with the goal that the computer should, should solve this for you. Okay, so what is the finite volume method? Why is it called finite volume? I have a control volume. I have a governing equation, which is infinite control volume, but I'm trying to integrate it into a finite control volume, right? So that's called the finite volume method. A domain divided into finite volumes, okay? You have finite volumes and you're solving equations within that, which is called the finite volume method. Okay, so let's take an example. Okay, so we should take a very simple 1D steady state equation. Okay, steady state conduction. So when you have a 1D steady state conduction, say this is a rod. Okay, and I'm just going to divide that into what was the first step? Meshing, right? So I'm taking a rod and I'm dividing it into three uh, boxes. So that's going to be three control volumes. Okay. And what was the second thing? You have to write the partial differential equation. So does anyone know the steady state conduction 1D? Okay, let me write it. Del squared T by del squared. Yes. So I presume a source term as well at this point. Okay. So what we're saying here is that uh, your thermal conductivity gradient, a derivative of that plus S, so source term is equal to zero, okay? So now what do I have to do? I'll have to start integrating this, okay? Integrating this, how? Integrating this across this control volumes, okay? So let's look at it a little bit more in detail, okay? So you have the heat conduction equation like I've just mentioned, right? So you have d by dx, k dt by dx. So can someone just tell me whether this is the advection or the diffusion term? Anyone? Advection? Let's, oh, diffusion. let's go back and check what did I write. Okay, so now can everyone tell me? Diffusion. Diffusion. Diffusion, absolutely. So what are we saying? Conduction heat transfer, conduction heat transfer is a diffusion equation. Did you see that? Right? So um, what does it mean? By heat transfer, what is conduction? If I heat one end of the uh, bar, the other hand also slowly sees the heat, right? So how do we say that? The molecules within the solid vibrate and then they transfer the heat. So vibration, uh, that means diffusion, right? 
So diffusion is what we've been seeing and that's your conduction, pure conduction equation. There's no flow happening. So it is diffusion, great. So now I'm going to have to integrate this, right, in a control volume. Okay, so now I've divided the rod into three control volumes. Okay, so say the central control volume is of my interest, right? So that means that I have to, this control volume span is from here to here, from between the two yellow lines, right? So that means, let me call this, P means the present cell and some cell to my east is E cell, some cell to my left or the west cell. So this is the east of me and this is the west of my present cell, okay? Now the walls, let me call it small e and small w, okay? So essentially, the control volume P, which is I'm interesting, interested in, is I'm going to integrate this equation, integrating the equation from w to e, right? from west to east. Is that fine? Okay, because I'm trying to understand what is happening within that control volume. Okay, so when I integrate that, okay, now what I will make a first choice is, how do I divide it? See, I can have a rod, right? And I can divide it into 10 parts or I can divide it into three parts. What is the choice I'm making? The size of the cell is something I'm making a choice about, number one, right? So when I integrate it, then the dx is actually x, delta x, that size of the cell. So essentially I integrate it and you will get this. Is everyone okay with this? I've integrated this part and I'll just get k dt by dx, okay? And s delta x. So I've integrated this. Now, is this an algebraic equation? Not yet, right? Because I have a gradient term still. So I have to make a choice about this gradient. So let's look at what happens to this gradient term. Okay, so when I have this gradient term that is here, right? I need to decide where this gradient term is. So let's look at that equation. I've just rewritten that equation you see here, right? So it says k dt by dx at small e. Okay, so that means it says small e is here and small w is here, correct? So at this corner or this face of this control volume, I need to calculate this gradient. So dt by dx, I need to find out in this wall or face, that's what it's called, face of the control volume, okay? So now then I have to decide what the gradient is, okay? Let's say that this cell is about 100 degrees and this is about 50 degrees. Okay. Now I can make a choice again. I can say that, hey, listen, my cell is going to be fully 100 degrees. Okay. And this cell is going to be fully 50 degrees. Then what happens at the wall? There is a discontinuity. Okay. So that's not correct. So what we typically do is the center of the cell is what we assign a particular temperature. Okay, so this is 100 and this is 50, the center. Now I'm going to say that the variation is continuous. It cannot be discontinuous. So what I say is let me presume a linear variation. Okay, so if I make an assumption that it's a linear variation, then I calculate the gradient, right? dt by dx. Okay, so then I say delta t by delta x. Okay. So this x that you see here is nothing but the distance between the two centers, delta x e, okay? So we say that Tp, which is temperature of the center of this cell, minus Te, which is this here. So Te minus Tp by the distance is what we are seeing. So now I've got an algebraic form here. The same thing I do it for this other term. Okay, so can I substitute? So what I do is I substitute this and this back into this equation. Okay, so now if I substitute that and then what I'm going to do, I'm going to club all common terms, all TP terms together or T terms together or TW terms together, which is what 
you will see here. I have clubbed all the common terms, all the TP terms together, all the T, TW terms. Why I am solving for temperature? So I'm only interested in the different temperatures, right? And then what I'm going to do is all these are coefficients. So I'm just going to call it TP ka coefficient, I'll call it AP. T coefficient, I'll call it A, AW, and B means source term. That's all. Now I have an equation, right? I have an algebraic equation. There's no problem. If I know my thermal conductivity and the cell size, I can solve this equation. Okay. Great. Now, uh, we were looking at conduction, which is a diffusion, right? Now, we have actually in transport equation, we saw four terms, of which two were the transport terms, which was diffusion, and then there was an advection term, correct? So, this part, which is the diffusion part, we already, I showed you how we did this, right? Now, the advection part is similar, okay? Now, I won't spend a lot of time, but we make a similar choice about advection to get an algebraic equation, okay? So, I will skip that for this moment, okay? Now, just assume that we will use a scheme sim similar to this linear approximation. We will use a central different scheme, okay? Okay, and what we will say is this advection term phi e is equally informed by phi p plus phi e by 2. So I'm saying here my flux term phi e is a half of these two. Okay, we will not go into too many details. The essence that you have to understand is this equation, no? this partial differential equation I'm converting into an algebraic equation. So every term I have to make some approximation and you will get an algebraic equation which will take this form. Okay, all right. So now once I've created that algebraic equation, I need to go further and solve it. Okay, now before we solve it, a quick recap, what did we learn? We said that equations from system, it goes to a control volume form. So the form that you know of is the control volume form. Then we looked at the stages in FVM. What is that? We mesh it to make it into common smaller control volumes, the domain. Then we write the governing equation, right? And then we will integrate the governing equation, fine? Once we've integrated, you will have a gradient term. So you make specific choices, like a linear variation or an average, and convert it into algebraic form, right? What was the algebraic form that you had? AP TP is equal to AE TE plus AW TW plus B. Okay, so how did I get this expression? I took say, um, say this cell here. I said, this is my P cell, right? This is my P cell. To my P cell, I have a neighbor, east neighbor and a west neighbor. So if I want equation for this particular cell, I need information from my neighbors. Why? Because they are interacting with me. Flow is going to happen from one to the other, right? So for every cell, you will have one equation, correct? So that means for my nine cells, I am going to have nine such equations, correct? If I'm solving momentum, right? So then I have a system of algebraic equation, nine such equations on how many ever boxes you have. And I have this entire set of equations that I will have to solve. Okay. Take it. So how do I solve a system of equations? So I have a bunch of equations. Okay. And I have nine such equations. Okay. Now I, I remember we said APTP is equal to AE TE plus so on. So I can write this in a matrix form because computers can solve matrices. So I'm going to write all the coefficients as A, okay? The unknown, I have to find the temperature, right? The unknown as T is equal to any source term that you might have goes on the right-hand side. So this is in what form? AX 
is equal to d form correct so i club all the coefficients what all coefficients all the nine equation coefficients in this form the unknown here and the source term okay now this is for one equation i will have how many so how many unknowns are there let's take your momentum equation so you what are the unknowns for your navier stokes anyone the answer is there on the board and velocity u v w yes components and also uh, w then pressure and pressure. De density temperature pressure density is typically known for incompressible flows okay so you are talking about u v w and p right and temperature yes. if you are solving for the energy equation that's correct so okay. now i would have a system of equation so this set that you see here is for say u equation so i would have three such sets at least u v and p if temperature one more right and this is an entire set system of equations which you will have to solve okay now you can solve it in one go okay but typically it's more stabler to solve one at a time and help feed into the other okay now that is called the segregated approach meaning you solve one then use that to solve the other and then come back okay all right one question i have so now you have a equation which is your continuity equation which is your mass conservation equation and you have the momentum equation okay so that means you have a u that this is basically a u equation right momentum is also a u equation right it just happens to have a pressure term okay so um what you notice here is there is no explicit equation for pressure correct so then how am i going to solve and get pressure solution i don't know and it's very important because pressure also drives the flow right so here it appears that both these equations are largely u equations and uh, how am i going to find the pressure is a challenge okay so now where where have we moved on we have said algebraic equation i have done there's a bunch of algebraic equations i have to solve but you know there is one pressure term there which i don't have an equation for specifically how will i solve this part i don't know right so now we are looking at solving these equations in a segregated manner one after the other so let's look at how to do that okay so there's a method called simple which is semi implicit method for pressure linked equations okay how do we do this theek okay. so what i'm going to do first let me take this equation first the momentum equation okay i will say that let me assume the pressure okay i might have an estimate or i might have a previous time step if i'm solving for 10 seconds i will know what is happening in the 7th second for the 8th second information so let me assume some value of p theek okay. hai now if i assume a value of pressure okay then what happens i can solve this equation okay and i will get a velocity okay now unfortunately this velocity because i have assumed the pressure this velocity is not the perfect velocity okay it's going to be some intermediate velocity now i have to check okay how will i check it i'm using the mass conservation okay so what am i saying here theek hai i know some velocities theek hai so that means i can calculate continuity mass flux right what is mass flux rho u correct so if i were to calculate the mass flux in all the four sides of the control volume and look at the continuity value and check whether it is equal to zero so i will get a intermediate velocity using that i will calculate all the mass fluxes using this assumed value u i am getting and i'll say listen is this equal to 0 most likely it will not because it's based on assumed pressure okay so then what will i have to do i'll have to now change or change this value or tweak this value so that this continuity is balanced 
back and forth. So I'll do a second iteration. I will tweak that pressure a little bit. I will get the U star. Then I will check whether all the mass fluxes are balanced and so on and so forth. So that is how. So in a segregated manner, I first solve this and I come to this. Okay. So this equation is called the um, pressure correction equation because this is the controlling equation basis which you will correct the pressure. This is a very uh, uh, basic overview. There are different technicalities in this. I'm not going into that. But this is how you will go back and forth and correct your uh, equations and solve it. Okay. So what have we seen in this entire spread? We've seen that system equations or system laws are written into control volume. How? Reynolds transport theorem. Okay. Then once you've written those conservation equations, you will have to divide the domain into smaller boxes. Once you've divided the domain, that equation you will integrate for that domain. Make some choices like linear variation or averaging and make it into an algebraic equation. Once this algebraic equation is written, there'll be several such algebraic equations because of the number of control volumes. Then you'll make it into a matrix. Then this matrix you will solve in this particular order. Momentum first and then you will check it with continuity and goes in circle. So once this is done, you get a U, V and P. You will come to the energy equation and just substitute the new values and then you will get the temperature values. So this is what is happening in CFD in the background. So any domain, so you take an aeroplane, right? You would first mesh around it. So you want to see the flow around it, you will mesh the domain. And you will select equations and you will say, this is my velocity here in this brown tree here, there. Then what it will do in the background is convert it into algebraic equations. Okay. And you will choose the choice, the second order up when first order up in this numerical scheme that you, you will select that and it will form the equation and keep the matrix ready. And you will say run and it will solve and show you this in every box. What is the UNP? Okay. So this is this entire spread of CFD from start to finish, which is what your open form does in the background. Okay. Any questions? Ma'am, while you are explaining about uh, that transfer, actually diffusion transfer, at the, at the area between uh, the cells, on, actually on what basis we are assuming the transfer is linear now? That is from the center cell to the right cell, that is E cell or the W cell. Right. So basis, why we are assuming it to be linear. So we typically do a, what is called the Taylor series. Do you know that? So there is something yes, called the Taylor series and the Taylor series, if you do the first order approximation or the second order approximation, different orders will have different uh, variations. Okay. So the key thing here is if you're solving for temperature, typically it takes a linear profile for conduction the gradient. So then you will say, let me do uh, a specific order approximation basis, the Taylor series, which will why you will get a linear series. So those are all technicalities I'm not getting into. If you're solving some other equation with different physics, then you'll have to do a different order approximation. So it depends upon the order, right? It is depending upon your Taylor series approximation. And that's a choice that you will have to make again. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ma'am, could you explain advection once? Uh, okay. So, um, what in advection did you have problem understanding? Like, I didn't get the general idea of what it is. Could you like diffusion? I understood, but advection. Okay. So, let me do another one. Okay. So, um, say you have, uh, you know, particles, and there is going to be some kind of flow that's happening, right? As a bulk. So what happens here is that the flow will move as a bulk forward, okay? Now a good way to think about this is imagine you have a pipe, okay? And uh, you have say two fluids uh, that's flowing into this pipe, right? And this is about uh, 500 degrees Celsius. Okay. And let me pick another fluid, which is going to be at two degrees. 
right? So if, what would you expect? Uh, so this is this arbitrary line that I have, right? What do you expect the temperature profile uh, to be? So I can have, say, uh, let me talk about the temperature profile being 100, 500 degrees here. And it's just flowing, right? So two degrees here. So let me say at time t is equal to zero, there is no fluid in this. But then after, after that, I start the pump and then it's pumping these two fluids in here, right? So slowly in these parts of the zones, you will say 50, 500 degrees and two degrees. Am I correct? So that's advective movement. That bulk fluid just moves carrying that energy, okay? But in ideal conditions, what will you see? Actually, you won't see a 500 and 2 degree dis uh, you know, discontinuity here. What will you see? You will see a 500 somewhere here that will drop down to 200. And then this will be somewhere at 50 degrees, right? So why does that happen? Because here in this part, there's going to be diffusion that's happening. Vibratory motion, exchanging information in all directions. So advection is just, if it's pure advection and, and say in this world there was no conduction-based or diffusion-based transfer, then there will not be any arbitrary movement. There will only be this bulk differentiation that's happening, bulk movement of energy that's happening. Is that clear? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thanks, ma'am. Yeah. Hello, ma'am. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, could you explain once, ma'am, how the conversion into algebraic uh, form that matrix formation takes place ma'am from governing equation ah so that is a little bit more complicated so what you will do here is essentially uh, i will run through um, so if i have this uh, control volume like this right so how will i access this control volume i'll do an i and a j okay so i is equal to one two three four and j is equal to one two three four so i'll start looping Okay, so I'll say A of 1 comma 1. Okay, and then so if this cell is here, so if this is my interested cell, my neighbor is say, um, what does I call that? A of 1 comma 2, right? So A west is 1 comma 2, A east is going to be um, say 3 comma 2, right? That's here. So if I'm going to populate in this entire matrix, then I'll know that if I'm interested in this particular cell, then the particular AW, this is AW and AE for that particular AP. So I will populate. Is that quick and easy? Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so uh, like it, uh, this is for complete mesh. So. Hmm. This is for the complete mesh. So I'll start looping in from starting from A11. So I'll go to A11 and I'll say, is there any AW? There will be a particular AW, there'll be a particular AE. So I'll start populating that here. Then I'll go to this cell. For this particular cell, what is the A1 and A2? So then I'll come to the next cell and say, I'll populate it here. So you will get a matrix, which is like this. This will be the center value. This will be the surrounding values like this. Something like that you will get. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And ma'am, on the right hand side, there will be the matrix for the uh, unknown, huh? like on the correct. So you will have this is a this coefficient, this is the unknown, and you will have the solution here. Yeah. B source term. We calculate the like velocity uh, for the navy stock set. So we will calculate the uh, velocity and then uh, we will compare it with the continuity. Yeah, so, I mean, the continuity is the checking. Equation. Checking. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, does open form give us a sense of the error introduced by this discrete discretization error? Because we are assuming that the value is constant over the entire grid cell. So from the continuous uh, case, uh, the discrete case will have some, some sort of error or something. So typically, definitely, the discrete case will have error. Now, the point is um, there are two types of errors. One is your numerical error. And one is actually this approximation that you choose, okay? By numerical error, what I mean is in your Taylor series, it's an infinite series. So if I say dt by dx, okay, is equal to uh, five terms. So term one, one plus two plus, there are three terms, right? And you will truncate after the first two term, first term say, okay? So then what happens is you have truncated this. So this is going to give a numerical error. 
okay your conservation of mass or momentum or energy will not get fully solved because you have all, you know ruled out these numbers so that's called the numerical error the other one is called uh, actually the physical error wherein you make the choice of uh, say for example my flow is happening in this direction right now that means i this uh, cell here typically if it's advection it will get complete information from the previous cell okay now i don't do that i make an approximation that listen this cell gets information equally from both my side cells that is an error in itself a minor error so that means you will have some physical uh, deviations so the only way you will estimate it a is to check something called the residuals you will have a lecture in i think the second or the third day how to estimate errors okay so one is residuals the other is you take a parameter of interest now how will i check whether say this simulation is correct pure advection i will look at this area and i look at the temperature in that area is it anything other than 502 then i know i'm wrong right and the third so that's very analytical based uh, checking of the physics the third thing is you take a validation experiment and then you simulate and you compare your errors that's actually the physics that you're checking so there are three levels of checking that you would do is that okay got it ma'am thank you yes um i mean my my concern was that i guess so if you check residuals that'll give you some sense of so my concern was you know how to interpret the simulation whether we can say that there is any sanity in the simulation uh like some threshold i mean uh, you know if the error is less than this etc then the simulation gives you some representation of reality versus is there a case where it can break down completely it's like garbage in garbage and it can absolutely break down so there are three levels and even in uh, residuals is a rudimentary thing there are other uh, norms uh, error norms that you can calculate but that's too advanced here so i don't want to go into that first round of check is a residual um the analytical check and a physics checking validation oh, okay thank you yeah ma'am is there any basis for uh, assuming the initial pressure like uh, absolutely so if you're doing uh, something which is approximately atmospheric pressure you will take something if you're doing in a pressurized fluidized bed or you know reactors you will take that pressure as a standard so it's typically informed by the application that you're working on okay ma'am then also like uh, at first we assume the pressure then we check it with the continuity equation and when we go to the next iteration like how do we assume uh, like is it an assume pressure again or like is there so let me quickly explain that um so let me presume a very rudimentary example say um, i have assumed a particular pressure and that has given me um, that has given me um an influx say uh, based on continuity i say mass flux of 4 and 4 is getting out and 2 and 2 is getting in so this is after the first iteration right so now what it tells me is that i am chucking out more than i am pulling in which is not possible so then what do i do i actually um, i'm hoping you're seeing my screen right so um so what you see here is there is more going out then coming in so what do i have to do i actually have to have slightly more coming in correct so if i have to have slightly more coming in or in other ways i have to have slightly more going out right so then i will correct the pressure i will either increase so once you increase the pressure what happens things will stop coming in but if you want more to come in i will drop the pressure correct so if i have assumed a pressure of say 2 bar i will drop the pressure by say 0.5 so 1.5 i will say let me take it as 1.5 bar right so that means more is going to come in theek okay? hai so in the next iteration so basis this logic i will decide if i have to drop my pressure or increase my pressure for the next iteration so that i can pull in more does that make sense yes ma'am so we manually give this no we can manually give it to each and every iteration right no so what we have is something called the pressure correction equation you would have written in terms of pressure correction and it will correct itself that's a little bit advanced i don't want to go in here at this point okay ma'am yeah thank you but the concept is this essentially this is what it does okay ma'am okay i think we are uh, a pile do you want to take over